Minecraft allows you to type in any world seed you can imagine and get a unique world. It then seemingly stores this seed, which contains 97,000 terabytes of information and allows someone on the other side of the planet to get the same world using it. More impressively, this works without an internet connection and when done results in a world that is just 0.3 megabytes. How can this be possible? Well, Minecraft's world generation is magically able to hide the basics of procedural generation, which is used to create mountains this high, rivers this wide, and structures this weird, as well as decide where every tree or and tall grass will be. But how does it do that? Let's go through the four simple steps to solving this very big problem in today's quick dive. Every Minecraft world is at its core a bunch of cubes fused together to make one giant cube that then represents your Minecraft world. However, it doesn't look like a giant stone slab like this, and instead a regular Minecraft world looks like it's not a giant cube because many of these are filled in with air, and so the first step Minecraft has to do is work out where there should be air and where there shouldn't be. Even if Minecraft only had two types of blocks, one air and one non-air, deciding what every single block should be and storing that for an entire Minecraft world would take up more storage than is available on the most expensive storage device known to man right now, a $12,500 SSD, and so it's impossible to actually store this somewhere, and the game has to work out how to do so in some better way. You could do so randomly, but then you get a Minecraft world that doesn't look like anything, or you can do so procedurally. Procedural generation will create a world using a set of steps that is repeated the same each time, meaning that instead of having to store an entire world's worth of data, you can just store the data the player is passing through because they are generated on the fly as players go near it. This is why when a brand new update comes out, new chunks in your world will generate with the new data because they haven't yet been stored even though you've had that Minecraft world from updates from long before it was ever possible. This is something the game does for each of the four steps, starting with... Working out what should be air and what shouldn't be is a surprisingly hard challenge. This is because if you take this very basic map of stone and air, doing this by hand, breaking blocks and placing blocks, every single one of those breaks and places would have to be stored to a computer somewhere, and so doing so procedurally is both important, but also can be much faster. I mean, looking at this very same example, all this actually is is four big peaks that have been decided by the game, and rather than being big mountains up by themselves of a certain height, instead the game is then telling it to smoothly go between these and it creates four peaks and a valley between them. This could then be scaled up to the rest of the world, except obviously you don't want your valleys perfectly spaced out, and so either you can decide these by hand, but that's very expensive, or you can decide to have them perfectly spaced out, and that's boring, or you can do so randomly, and somehow that looks way worse, it looks too random, and so instead what you need is something semi-random, and where this comes in is Perlin noise. So when you look at a map like this, you might see TV static, you might see uh, one of those Ross Archer diagrams where you've got to see a butterfly in there, and if you don't, then you're actually a serial killer, bad news by the way, uh, but what actually the game sees in this is a great way to have randomness that feels more like the true actual world. There are not random hills placed everywhere, instead there are certain areas where they clump together and this map perfectly represents that. Imagine any of these blurs as actually being where mountains could be in black and where everything else could be in white. And so instead of just deciding that hills should be in the black and the flats should be on the white, instead the game uses three separate sets of values and these values determine the height of the terrain, the continental of terrain, the erosion, as well as where peaks and valleys should be. This means all the game has to do is look at the map and it can work out how it should generate the terrain by using that simple code from earlier mixed with one of these. And how do they find these maps, I hear you asking? Well, this map is randomly determined by your seed. When you use the exact same map of randomness to determine your random world, it stops being random and starts being procedurally generated. And so when you use the same seed, you always get the same world in terms of terrain. And when you create the same base terrain, you also have the same Step two. Step two is a fun step because we go from having two blocks to three, simply adding water to the world and deciding anything that is not a cave and is 62 Y or below should be filled with water, now gives us lakes and rivers, as well as mountains, as well as the blank ground, which makes the world start to feel a bit more alive, something they double down on on the next step. What's the only thing better than three blocks? Well, four, or five, or six, because depending on the biome, now the base layer of the game will remove that bottom base of stone and instead put in the biome-specific block of grass, or sand, or even gravel, disappointingly. This is something the game can very quickly do because it calculates the biome for every single block using another algorithm. This uses the continentalness from earlier, combined with two extra values determined by another blur map. This implies the temperature and the humidity of a given block. Funnily enough, when you 
you go to F3 on Java, you can actually see these exact values if you really want to. But in either case, the game combines these values and looks them up in this table to work out what biome should go in which place. And now you've got a world that looks pretty much real. It's just missing a few extra details, which is where the final step comes in. The last things that your seed determine randomly are perhaps the most important, at least to an end player, because once you have the random height map and biomes, you do have worlds that look different, but they feel a bit boring until you add the trees, the structures, and the ores to the world, because having diamond ores be in the same place for every single chunk would be boring. Having it be random means that you actually have to mine. Having trees be random makes the world feel just a bit different, and indeed having structures in these random places is what makes every world feel like something unique. Small to terrain decoration, big terrain decoration, and structures are all generated very differently using different algorithms, but they all happen at this exact same stage, and it basically shows how all you need are four pieces of code, a random set of digits, which the player is so kind as to provide, and all of a sudden, you can now make a world that feels purely unique, but yet is perfectly able to be recreated with someone else not having any of the same information. This simple use of code to take a very small given input and make a much more complicated output is something which makes the entire modern world work from crypto to encryption to indeed the very platform you're watching this on. YouTube takes the videos that you watch, like, and subscribe to and does a lot of complicated things to it to give you your homepage, which is entirely unique to you. And if you want to influence its results, consider subscribing to the channel or turning the notifications on so that the YouTube algorithm knows that you want to see more of these. And if you don't want to see more of these, then you watch this video all the way through now. So whoopsie. Either way, hope you enjoyed the quick dive. Make sure to check out the previous ones in the series and I'll see you for the next one.